So everybody has notice, and if the point of this body of law for the indictment is jurisdiction and notice, and this court has said repeatedly that it is, then they had notice. And if they wanted to object and say, well, there seems to be a problem here, I want the state to fix it, they could have done that. And the trial court could have made the state fix it, because clearly this is what the state wanted to do. But this just ends up being another error that sometimes happens because nobody's perfect. And if nobody notices it, or someone notices it and doesn't object because they knew exactly what they were there for, then you don't get to complain on appeal. And so that resolution in this case is completely consistent with what this court has done in 2009 on a motion to quash for failure of an indictment to allege that two murders were done in the same transaction. It's consistent with what we do when the body of the charging instrument half-heartedly but fails to charge a felony hindering apprehension. It's what we do when the body alleges a facially complete misdemeanor tampering, but the caption says it's a felony. And it's what we do when somebody says, well, you didn't charge me with it because the body just says defendant. We tell them, look at the caption. The caption says your name. You didn't complain pre-trial. So it's an indictment, and also whatever form of objection you had has been forfeited under 1.14b. So what I'm asking for is consistency. Um, yes, this charging instrument, in some ways, is better than the one in Del Rosa. Um, in, in other ways, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say the body is enough, because I, I want everybody, I want the state to double check everything and, and take care of some of these errors. And the fact is, they are careful. This is, what, the fourth case we've had like this since 2007? Um, there are more. It's the fourth one to reach this court, but um, it doesn't happen that often, thankfully. And so I want the state to do a better job, but the legislature has clearly said, and this court has backed them up on it, defense attorney, read the entire charging instrument. And if there's something that should stick out to you, you should say something. And, um, and in Del Rosa, I made the argument, and I make the same argument here, I think it was maybe misunderstood in Del Rosa. I'm not saying I don't care what the charging instrument says. Look at what the case was about, and then we'll just, you know, we'll call it trial by consent. All I'm saying is that the, this body of law is about notice, and you can see that at no point was the defendant's defense prejudiced in any way, then you don't have a problem. And so even if the person had objected and the, the trial court had said, no, I'm not making the state fix it, or I'm allowing the state to fix it over objection because we're within 10 days, for example, it wouldn't have been harmful because the indictment fairly read according to the test in Jenkins charged you with this offense. So they're not, they're not increasing the offense. They're not adding to the charges. Um, and you had perfect notice. So I, I think what I'm asking for is consistent with what the court has done. Um, I, it would be great if the mistake hadn't happened, but, but we're here, and I think this is, this is a fair resolution of it. Did deputy sheriff equals peace officer? Why do we even have to look beyond the allegations of the body of the indictment? Why would they have to? I, I, I agree with you that because they are a peace officer by definition, you can make the argument that at least Someone, someone should be thinking, oh, is this going to be a second? The, the problem is, you know, that didn't change until 2017. So this, this body does also perfectly satisfy a charge under B1. Now, that's the only reason I'm not saying we should win this at the body. Um, I, I'm, and I'm asking that we just look at the entire piece of paper like we do in every other charge-related claim. Are there no other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. May I please the court? Uh, my name is Tommy Jackson. I, along with Mr. J.W. Johnson, represent Sean Crawford, the applicant in this case. Uh, I tried this case. It was mine and Mr. Johnson's, and um, I've listened to Mr. Messing's arguments, and I believe that I agree with him. There was no ambiguity in the body that um, this case was different for us in that Sean got 12. He got 12 to do on a 2 to 10. 2 to 20 would have been peace officer. And uh, those Cusper cases he's talking about, Kirkpatrick's, Kirkpatrick, Jenkins, and Teal deal with facially incomplete bodies. Here we have a facially complete body of the indictment. I can pick up an indictment as a prosecutor for a long time. I can pick up an indictment from Potter County to 
Pegasus County, Dan Salina County, and I can tell you what he's charged with. I can pick it up on the fly. I've drafted indictments with captions that are, are as descriptive as they can be or as broad as you've ever seen them. And there's no rhyme or reason as to what I put in there, but I try my best when I was prosecuting and to get the section right, too. And often I'm wrong. And I never figured out should I put the section that's the punishment or should I put the crime section. And I, I still remember that to this day, and I don't know. But I always read the body, and I feel like that's the truth. The truth lies there. And I brought this up at the trial level, stood up, and I said, Judge, we've got a problem. And he said, well, if there's any discrepancy between the caption and the body, the body controls it. He snapped judgment at that. That was off the top of his head. Later on, he had to reel back a little bit. Um, and he did so, although the charge inevitably charged him with assault on a public servant. That was what was in the charge. That's what the elements that we put to the jury and that they found him guilty of. Um, the punishment range was then 2 to 20 because the judge said it was assault on a peace officer, not just a public servant. Um, I think that... Counsel, the, the two assault provisions really don't differ that much, correct? It's only public servant versus peace officer. That's really the only difference between the two. And then a peace officer is a public servant, correct? That's, that's true. I think that there's a distinction there, and the legislature chose those words purposefully. Public servant versus peace officer. Those are the magic words. I understand within, excuse, within the body of the indictment, excuse me, uh, it says deputy sheriff. Um, so it's it, it's in the body of the indictment that you got a peace officer. So you know, doesn't that provide your client with notice of what he's charged with? I believe that the notice element is one element of it, but I believe that what the grand jury's intent is another. You know, who's to say that the grand jury didn't look at that charge and look at Sean or no Sean? We're in Menard County here. There's two grocery stores and the Dollar General. I live in Eden. I mean, these people know he had to stand out with the cops. He's, it was a big deal in town. And who knows that the grand jury didn't look at it and say, yeah, it's peace officer. Maybe we're going to cut this old boy a break. Is there anything lesser on this? And they say, well, yeah, public servant. And so they asked Tanya or an investigator to go back and change it. I, I don't know. We're not. I'm not in there. I used to be in there, and I loved it. But I'm not in there anymore, and I can't, I don't know if they cut the old boy a break or they chose not to, and they said that's going to be enough. But in the body of the indictment, it says deputy sheriff. So. And that, what is a deputy sheriff? Well, that's a very good question. Um, a deputy sheriff, by definition, is a peace officer. Right. Now, the funny part about this, it adds a wrinkle, and I didn't really bring it up too much, was that... The second count in this indictment that was abandoned by Miss Alshweed the day of trial, because she didn't want to confuse things and a little <laughs> misprint in it, um, was a gentleman by the name of Michael Smith. Michael Smith is a reserve sheriff deputy, and a reserve sheriff's deputy is required to carry a full-time peace officer's license in order to be a peace officer. So I would argue, yes, ma'am, with, with Burl Hag on count one, that's exactly right. They're one and the same. Peace officers are public servants. Not all public servants are peace officers. But if you're looking at the indictment as it was handed down, Michael Smith could qualify as a public servant as opposed to a peace officer. And so... So you would have us look at the abandoned count? The, the entire... the state would have us look at the caption? I, I would look at the entire chart, the, the body of the charging instrument as it was handed down in, in the indictment. And I'd say if that argument is only supported by a very large irregularity we had in count two, I've never seen it before, probably never see it again. But if you just look at count one in the body, I understand what you're saying. I really do, where there appears to be an ambiguity. Um, Mr. Messinger says they're not, and he's smarter than me, so I say I, there's not. But... Um, Here's my question: What if he? What if the state had just crossed out the words "public servant"? Sure, and left it to where you now look to the. Well, caption. I just said deputy sheriff. No, but forget the caption. Like, let's just say we're just the body. 
cross out the word public servant, but like Judge Keel has pointed out, the words deputy sheriff are there. Do we have a completed offense at that point? You have a completed misdemeanor. Okay. And then you, according to our rules, uh, would have to look the bright line rule that's in intact. We'd have to look to the indictment. I believe that's something Mr. Messinger brought up in his argument, and to where it's almost if you left out something, it would have it would have saved this. Less is more. I'm of the opinion the body is what it is. The caption is for when you're in grand jury and you're thumbing through these things and you're pulling names quick. You're pulling offenses quick. There's either a cop there or not. And you're presenting these things. It, they don't look at it. I don't know if they look at most of it. They're going to trust the prosecutor. But that's for him. That's not for them. Uh, the body is what I've always gone by. I picked up this indictment. We got on in August of 21. He was arrested in April, indicted June. August, we got hired, came to hire Mr. Johnson. And we were trialing in October. I mean, this he was incarcerated, and we were ready to rock and roll. No questions, no pushing. We went to trial. So when I picked up that indictment, came on, boom, immediately. We got a problem. I knew it. And I don't know if I'd be able to do that and a lot of times you have to, um, especially in small rural jurisdictions, you got a lot of clients. I have a lot of clients. I do court appointing work. 99% of my case is court appointing. I love it with all my heart. But you got to be able to pick up that indictment and roll quick. So I believe that allowing the state to choose which one it wants to pursue, if this indictment was to support either charge, when are they electing which one they're going to pursue? Do they wait to trial? Do they wait to the charge conference? Do they wait to board dire? Board dire, what you say in board dire doesn't have much effect on me. And in small rural jurisdictions, we don't object to board dire very often. It's kind of a professional courtesy. We extend each other. It's quid pro quo, though. So I'm going to get you back on the back end, but we don't object at that time. Well, counsel, you, it sounds like you had many opportunities to hear um, it said that it was a second degree felony, assault on a peace officer, uh, and you didn't object on those multiple occasions. Um, you know, in, in the arraignment, was it stated to be a second degree felony at that point? I can't remember the arraignment. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't there during arraignment, mm -hmm. and I cannot remember off the top of my head. I know he was arraigned, and I know how Judge Hoffman and Judge Ellis typically arraign individuals. The degree is not typically read. Uh, it's usually, is this your name, is this your date of birth, is it right, do you know what you're charged with? Okay. And most of the time it's waived uh, on the spot, but I, I, don't, I don't recall. Well, you were there during the trial, so you, you heard it stated several times that that your client was being charged with second-degree felony assault on a peace officer. Um, but you didn't object until after the jury was already seated. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma after he, what I believe, mischaracterized the charge to the jury after the indictment was read to the jury. So the indictment body was the part that was read. Never, never was the caption I've tried. Why would you, why would you object? that the lesser offense that you think you're charged with should be a greater offense. Yes, sir. And that's what the Court of Appeals said. It would be perverse to entertain the idea that I would subject my client to a uh, less defensible charge. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. I don't want that to come across as it was some subterfuge or some you know, grand scheme. I don't, I don't believe Sean needed more than 10. And that's, that's what my heart told me, and that's why I'm here. I didn't believe that he needed it. Um, and subjecting him to a 2 to 20 for these facts and how it happened, I didn't think it was right. Counselor, isn't it possible to be a deputy sheriff but not be a licensed police officer? Yes, sir. In very limited circumstances, I believe it's the reserve deputies the way I read it uh, is in Article 2 of the 
Code of Criminal Procedure defines what a peace officer is. It says sheriff, deputy sheriff, and those reserve sheriff, those reserve sheriffs, they added those reserve sheriffs that are uh, full-time licensed peace officers as a, uh, under the occupation center. So the term peace officer and deputy sheriff can't be, they're not necessarily interchangeable. The same term, basically. Yes, it would depend on what type of deputy sheriff Michael Smith on the second count, which I know we're not necessarily going too deep into that, but he was not a full-time deputy sheriff. He was something else. I'm just using that as an example. I might have to get a look to it, but he was he was a reserve. Yes. Uh, the, the opening line of the jury charge says he's accused of assault of a public servant, to wit, and peace officer. Yes, sir. So how do you get around that? There were only two places in that jury charge where the term peace officer was. It's the first line. Yes, sir. The application portion right. was public servant. And this is just like another case we had out of San Angelo where I'm practicing in Rikas. And it was Officer Chavarria. I know Officer Chavarria. He got, got 75, and it was our exact same situation here. Except in theirs, they changed the application portion to, to wit, a peace officer. And that's where the difference is. And his, I believe, it still should not have been added. Uh, I do not believe that he also had notice, but that's the difference here. Ours, it's only two places. It was never in that application portion or in the verdict form. And when the judge pronounced sentence, he said, uh, you've been convicted of assault on a public servant to a long time sheriff's deputy. Um, so that's how I would answer that, sir. Um, you know, there's a definition I put in my brief about what an indictment is, you know, the magic words. Mr. Messinger states that, you know, that's only where it's deemed sufficient against the peace and dignity of the state at the bottom and in the name and by the authority of the state of Texas at the top. I think between the magic lines is where we stay. And everything else is a savings provision for the state when they make a mistake. And it's a mistake. It's right, practically speaking, a lot of investigators draft these things. It's not right. I draft them my own. I charge a manual, but Odyssey will draft them. Investigators will draft them. Kansas County had Iliad. There's a little proprietary program. It would draft them. If you take the time to sit and pick and know your case law, go to Judge Newell's legislative update. I've been to several times. <laughs> then you know when the law changes because it doesn't get around to us too often. I mean, it does, but not like it does in a big city where it's in your face all the time. When we get it, I remember it. And 17 is when this took effect and they added that peace officer. So there's a difference now. The charging manual from 17 added it. I believe that um, either this was a mistake because when you flip the charging manual over <coughs> to the back page, that's where the peace officer language is. And whoever's drafting the indictment just went down and saw public servant as the charging language and grabbed it and stuck it in and flipped the page. So I pulled the 17 charge manual. Um, that being said, it was 19, you know, this was a considerable amount of time later. It should have been fixed, but I know that was the case in some jurisdictions that are smaller. And those things are expensive and people don't update them every year, but they should because indictments are important. And that's what we're all here for. Indictment changes lives. When you're indicted by something in a small town, your reputation's done. You'll never get it back. Never. You could, the no, local newspaper could send something in to fix it, it doesn't matter. And so I don't think it's too much to expect the state, when they do draft it, to take the time and get it right. You get a chance at it, you're going to charge a man. Um, indictment will ruin a life. Most of them are right. They should be right. Um, you know, De La Rosa, I think, is, is pretty much on point. There's a few minute differences, um, but De La Rosa is going to be controlling. I was surprised we got to come up here and do this because I thought De La, Rosa, De La Rosa answered my questions. I read all the dissents, and I know who to look to kind of because I saw your pictures online, and um, but I don't. I don't see much variance from De La Rosa. De La Rosa was a lot worse circumstance. That's a hard call to make. You got an old boy who's convicted of 
three counts of that kind of serious stuff. My guy threw a chair in the way of a cop when he unconstitutionally broke into his house. Okay, that's a, and I know we're broad spectrum here, but Dolorosa, it's, it's on what, point. What distinction do you see between Dolorosa and this case? I'll run out. Uh, the nature of conduct, crime versus circumstances surrounding conduct, crime. But I mean, in terms of what was alleged in the indictment, in the body of the indictment, do you see a distinction? No, ma'am. I think so they're you both. just think that this this indictment is just like Delarosa's indictment. I believe they're both facially complete, and, and I think that for me is where my analysis of it stops. Facially complete. Now, in Delarosa, the body of the indictment alleged a single complete felony. Right? It didn't suggest in any way in the body of the indictment that there was a different version of sexual assault at play, did it? No, ma'am. Now, in this indictment, it said both public servant and deputy sheriff. Does sure. that not suggest two possible offenses? At first blush, I would say yes, but. I think the usage of the words public servant, we don't use that in our everyday vernacular. Our, our, I, don't, I don't know the last time I've said that outside of a very limited legal context, and it might be limited to this offense itself. So I think that would be what stuck out to me. So just that phrase, being in the indictment, that kind of overrode the more specific allegation that immediately followed it. Um, so you don't even want to look at the whole body of the indictment? I, I don't think that there's any necessary conflict to me because a deputy sheriff is a public servant. And I didn't want, if they meant peace officer, they would have qualified him as a peace officer. I think they chose public servant for whatever reason. And I think I got a little facetious in my brief where we're going to start recording the grand jury's proceedings. Of course not. But... When I saw public servant, I thought, well, maybe it was a break. And it's a lesser. And maybe they just know Sean. And that's kind of where I stopped at it. And I know that they, they had a guy who was a public servant, but he was also a peace officer. And that word, public servant, snapped to it immediately. And that, that was, that's what I hung on. Um, Thomason. I believe the court was correct on Thomason. That's another case that we don't want to mention. Uh, Mr. Messier didn't mention too much on. It's a theft case with an aggregate. Uh, they multiple thefts and they made them elect because it's a facial complete indictment. And even though that might not be aggregate theft, what the prosecution meant, they're stuck with it because it's a complete indictment and you're stuck with, with what's in the body if it's complete. Smith, I threw around Smith for a while. I read it, and I knew Mr. Messing was going to talk about it. Smith was pretrial. And Smith, they did the right thing with his capital murder, multiple counts of murder. The state stood up and objected. The state asked to amend the indictment. We forget, and I know we hear, you know, adversarial process and the defendant's burden. Prosecutors have to be the best defense attorney in the room. I truly believe that. They are the overseers of justice. They don't have a client. I think, and I'm not putting them on a, on a high burden or increasing it. I think in there they should be because I felt like that's how I was. When I was a prosecutor, you want to fix it if you see it. If it's wrong, you fix it. If it's bad and you have to dismiss it, you dismiss it. You know, because that's justice. You're bound by justice. Thank you. May it please the court. A uh, couple of points I wanted to respond to. One, the point Judge McClure made about how the state would be in a better position if we just put less information in the body. That way we would almost force you to look at the caption. I don't want the state to put less information in. I, I want the state to put in all the information that they think they need to plead and that will give proper notice. And we can fight over the margins about how many factual variants are actually required in a given case, but I think any holding that that gives incentive to the state to just, we'll just leave stuff out. We'll see if somebody complains. That way we can't overspeak and get into trouble. 
I don't know if that's the way to, to, to get fair trials. Uh, the, the point Judge Richardson made about the first line of the jury charge. I think that counsel, counsel, if that's your argument, then why is it that we shouldn't be tag tagging the state with any ambiguity in the charging instrument? And saying, well, if it's ambiguous, it's up to the state to make sure it's not ambiguous. That would make sure that we have better trials. The people of Texas passed a constitutional amendment that enabled the legislature to pass a statute mm -hmm. that then set the stage for all of your opinions saying the defendant is responsible for Right, spot. but that's assuming that there's a problem substantively with the, the charge. This is that if the body of the indictment lets a, a facially valid charge, why is it that we wouldn't just say, well, in that situation, there's no reason to object because the state's got to get it right or they're bound by what they, they've alleged. And, and that's like if you put electrical tape over your check engine light, you don't really have a problem. The charging instrument is the charging instrument. Mm -hmm. That's what the grand jury either dictated or signed off on. But you're assuming that the check engine light is actually on because there's nothing wrong with this charging instrument except that maybe it's ambiguous and we could just defer to the lowest charge because it does, as you even acknowledge, charge someone with assault on a public servant. You're trying to invent a defer to a lower charge why did we not defer to a, you haven't charged an offense? I'm not trying to admit anything. You're the one saying that you think that we should, we should be trying to make sure that we have better trials and we should make sure that we don't let the state make mistakes. I'm saying the way to do that is we say, look, the charging instrument lists the lower charge and it's valid. Go with that. Well, you invented something then. That idea would be contrary to everything the court has done, everything the legislature has said about this area of law. It's the same argument that, that comes down to if we have a harm analysis and we find this sort of error harmless, then nobody's going to learn a lesson. Mm -hmm. well, when it, well, when it comes to jury, when it comes to trial error, we said teaching the prosecutor a lesson is no longer a valid interest. Sure. Either he had a fair trial or he didn't. And in this area of law, fairness is dictated by notice. Mm -hmm. And if we can look at the charging, again, Jenkins, but if it's, it's still, no, then, but that's what I'm saying. Like, if you're saying, if we're saying this is notice and the statute and the thing is ambiguous, then why don't we just say if it's ambiguous, it's not sufficient notice? Okay, but well, if you're saying it's truly ambiguous, meaning I look at the entire charging so instrument. So now you're inventing it's truly ambiguous. Not just ambiguous, truly The test in Jenkins is whether or not the face of the charging instrument is clear enough to give adequate notice, mm -hmm. not crystal clear and perfectly written so that there's no ambiguity. And if it could so, be one of two possible charges, in this case, when you have assault on a peace officer written out in three unmistakable ways mm -hmm. in the caption, which I assume, I think we have to presume the grand jury looked at it, either dictated it, looked at it and read it before the four person signed it, and possibly was told the caption by whichever prosecutor presented. The jury wouldn't have seen the caption, would they? No, the grand jury. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I'm sorry if I said jury. Um, yeah, the, the, the jury just knows what they're told. And I think, um, as I was saying before, what the jury charge says, I think that reflects how everybody there viewed it. This is a pun they viewed it as a punishment enhancement. It's not, you're supposed to get a jury finding. It's an apprendee issue. You're supposed to get a jury finding. But they said, we said public servant, we said deputy sheriff, we instructed that peace officer includes deputy sheriff. The first line says public servant went peace officer. And this is why on remand, I would say this is harmless under Niles for jury charge error. Um, Council, um, the application paragraph say public servant. Yes. How do we know that that's not what the jury, I mean, that's what the jury found him guilty of. How do... How well, that, do yeah. it, it, I mean, it's basically the equivalent of Niles where yeah. they didn't even ask for a public servant finding. In this case, they were asked for a public servant finding and they returned one. They should have been asked for a peace officer finding. So the harm analysis from Niles would be applied to this case should it reach remand. So um, let, let's say... Um, this trial goes along, state proves up, um, assault on a peace officer, no element is mentioned about public servant, and then at the close of the state's case, the defense stands up, moves for a directive verdict, and says, I'm pretty sure my guy was charged with assault of a peace officer, and I never heard the word peace officer. It, it, it's the same thing. The, the test for if you raise it in a motion to quash, um, assuming, that, assuming the defendant had raised it in Smith, so pretrial, um, if you object to it when counsel did, if you object to it at the, the charge conference, even if you frame this not as a notice issue or an indictment problem issue, but as a right to grand jury indictment issue, the test in Jenkins should answer all of those questions. You should have said something because 
This charging instrument, viewed objectively, gives, is clear enough, not crystal, but clear enough to give adequate notice that this charging instrument authorizes a second-degree assault on a peace officer. If you want to tell your client, look, this could go one of two ways. I'm not going to say anything pre-trial because we know the facts and we're prepared for trial. When Jeopardy attaches, I'm going to take my shot. Or when we get to the charge conference, um, or after the state rests, I'm going to take a shot at a direct verdict. You can tell your client that and tell them you should probably lose under Jenkins and Kirkpatrick and Smith. And as long as you told your client that, then, then that's fine. You take your shot. But we shouldn't let them get away with it. The charging instrument, in this case, there, there will be charging instruments where the, the caption completely mismatches a body. Nobody really knows what's charged. I would hope somebody would notice that. I would hope the state, as in Smith, would notice it. I would hope defense counsel would say, is this a theft or a capital murder? Somebody please tell me. So that may be a law school hypothetical that hopefully will never come to pass. But, but for everything else, we can apply the test in Jenkins. And this indictment passes the test in Jenkins. No other questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. The case is submitted. Uh, the court will stand in recess for five minutes. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three.
Good morning, Your Honors. May I please the court? I'm Robert Kell, Assistant District Attorney from Collin County, here on behalf of the state. In my time before this court, I would like to first address the proper statutory construction of the true source statute of Texas Election Code 255.004 because in order to determine whether a statute is, is constitutional, it must first be properly construed, otherwise the court will reach a wrong conclusion when applying no, constitution. What speech are we talking about here? At this point in the... In the what, what speech is this statute targeting? The speech that this statute targets is the wrongful identification of the source of a <clears throat> campaign communication. The statute states in 39 words, a person commits an offense if, comma, with intent to injure a candidate or influence the result of an election, comma, the person knowingly represents in a campaign communication that the communication emanates from a source other than its true source. Now, as this court is aware... Does it, counsel, does it have to be a true campaign? Does it have to be a real campaign? I mean, it could be made up. I don't understand your understanding. I don't know. I mean, like, could it be a fictitious campaign? A fictitious campaign? Yeah. I don't believe your honor, that it would be, Your Honor, because okay. it has to be it has I to mean, be an actual campaign. So you actually have to identify the campaign. Oh, you don't have to identify the campaign. Uh, you don't have to identify anybody. That's so it could be a made-up campaign. I'm not sure I understand. Your... If it's not a person, yes, they have to identify. Then it could be something that someone just made up. I, I'm not sure if Your Honor is asking me if it's an actual campaign that's ongoing or. No, I just I'm just trying to understand how it is you prove. How is it you prove that it's an actual campaign? Like, are you required to prove that it's an actual campaign? If you, how do you how, how is it limited to actual campaigns if you don't have to prove that it's an actual campaign? We do have to prove that it is an actual campaign as per the as per the definition of a campaign communication. Okay. Uh, we do have to prove that it is intended to harm an actual candidate in an actual campaign in order Does for it to... Have, is it limited to harming a candidate or can it also be read as just intent to affect the election? To influence an election, Your Honor. Yeah. It has to either harm a, can, a candidate or influence an election. Right. What would be an example of a campaign, com a campaign communication that doesn't have the intent of influencing an election? Like, aren't you wasting your money if you're not trying to influence an election? That's why the comma there is so critical in the middle of this statute. Because all campaign communications are intended to harm a candidate or influence an election by their very <coughs> definition as campaign communications. That's not what this law criminalizes. It's the knowing representation that it came from a source other than its actual source. That has to be <coughs> what is intended to harm a candidate. And that can be found because the antecedent clause with intent to injure a candidate or influence an election then there is the one comma that's in this actual statute, other than the a person commits an offense if comma. And as um, Judge Yeri, who is not here today, uh, stated in his concurrence in Ortega, which I placed in the state's uh, list of additional authorities last night, it was, I'm sorry, yesterday afternoon, Ortega versus State, in his concurrence, he discussed the serial comma rule and how it affects whether an antecedent applies to everything, everything else, else or if, if it, it only, only applies, applies to one or two, or two items in the rest of the statute. statute. Now, in, in this case, case there is only one comma. comma. And so that antecedent with intent to injure a candidate or influence an election applies to <laughs> everything that follows, including the prohibited <laughs> conduct, which in this case is the knowing misrepresentation of the, com the communication source. It's not enough that the campaign communication has to be intended to harm a candidate. It is that the knowing misrepresentation of the source has to be intended to harm a candidate or influence an election. Can it just be the intent to influence the election and not to harm, harm a candidate? It's one or the other because it's one or the, other. the statute says or. So if it's like a, if it's like a fake campaign communication, if someone says they're from the Republican Party of Texas and say vote Republican, that's that's influencing an election. That's something that would be influencing an election, even if it's not directed at a particular candidate. Which is only part of the analysis. Right, right, right. I'm yes. just saying, that's what I'm saying. Like, yes, yeah. the, the, the connector there is or, mm -hmm. so it would be either harm a candidate or influence an election. 
but that entire phrase has to apply to the knowing misrepresentation. And so that is, the, that is the critical component of the statutory construction. It is the misrepresentation itself has to be intended to cause harm or influence an election, not just the campaign communication. Because the misrepresentation has to be intended to influence the election? Yes, Your Honor, because the only comma in the relevant portion of the statute separates that particular clause from the entire rest of the statute. Ergo, under the serial comma rule, the absence of any future commas means the first part applies to the entirety of the second part. And your reading of the statute means that we don't really care what the actual communication was. We That's only care that the person forwarding it on or sending it out is misrepresenting that they're part of a campaign or not a campaign, but something that we don't know that is correct. Okay. Absolutely. That is correct. The, the content of the communication itself is irrelevant. It just has to be a campaign. And because the charging instrument in this situation says Republican campaign. It just says Republican campaign, right? Yes, Your Honor. Yeah, so, like, I'm not understanding. Like, that's an actual campaign? Like, is he representing that that's an actual campaign? That there's a, just a Republican campaign? That's enough? Well, and I, and I really, we don't have much of a record developed in this sure, process, that's right. so I would be going outside the record. What we have to prove is that this, that this particular individual represented that this communication was coming from someone other than himself and that that particular misrepresentation was intended to do harm. Not, nothing having to do with the content of the communication. But the, 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 it has to come from someone other than himself that is a part of a campaign. Or just another party that the identification of that particular party alone would cause harm. Such as, so if it, okay, well then that's a good point. So what if it's just someone that says, I'm, a, I'm an activist. I'm an activist and I'm trying to urge you to vote. That's enough of an identification of, of that's enough of a, a representation. Assuming they're not an activist, but like, if they just say I'm an activist, that's enough. If a person, if a person is misidentifying themselves in a campaign as opposed to the source of the communication, then that's a completely different. Well, okay, but say they, they create a false identity and say this false identity is an activist in the Green Party and they are, don't, don't vote for this person because they are unsafe at any speed, right? Like, so, so that's enough. Like, just saying they're an activist. That's only, only if somehow saying that I'm an activist harms the candidate right, or the election. Do you actually have to prove harm? We have you to prove the intent to harm with the identification, mm -hmm. only with the identification. Because mm -hmm. if we can't prove that, a person will be acquitted. Okay. And the thing is how false the statement is. It's just the representation, the false representation of who made the statement. Uh, the false representation of who, of who the statement is coming from. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we assume that campaign communications contain false, falsehoods and, and Untruth. We, we accept a certain amount of that. I mean, it's a real Is Santa Claus real? A historical figure, of, uh, I suppose. But, uh, if Santa Claus said in a communication, would that be? No. Actually, no, because the, the identity would not be intended to harm. And that's, that's really where the Dallas Court of Appeals erred was in their construction. They construed the statute so that it would reach anonymous speech, and it does not. Uh, there is no actual disclosure requirement in this statute. The statute only states that if you do identify someone as the source of the communication, you better tell the truth. And it works much similar to... Uh, well, you don't have to tell the truth, though, right? Right. Only about your identity. Well, you don't have to tell... Well, but if you're not doing it to harm or... If your identification... If your false identification is not intended to harm or influence the election, then you're fine, right? Correct. Okay. Absolutely. That is but if you... If you fail, if you give a false representation of an identity, like it's not your identity, then how are you notorious? Like you're not revealing your identity. You don't have to prove your own identity. You just have to prove that I represent myself to be someone else. Why isn't that anonymous? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Yeah, like, like that's what I'm saying. The person who's actually doing it hasn't identified themselves, but they are intended to be someone else. So they're, spe they're speaking, they're anonymous from their perspective. Yes, when they, when they pretend to be someone else. So why isn't that reaching an anonymous speech? Uh, because the anonymity is not what is meant to cause harm. And the anonymity is not meant to influence the election. It is the campaign communication that's intended, 
but the statute does the statute it's not sufficient for the campaign communication to intend harm or to influence election. It must be that false identity is intended it to But isn't that false identity the speech? Isn't the false identity the speech we're talking about? Yes. And so that from the perspective of the person making false identification, they are still being anonymous. Yes, and so the statute would not reach them unless that false identification <coughs> itself were meant to cause harm. Yes, Your Honor. Um, opposing counsel says that your position that it doesn't reach anonymous speech is inconsistent with what's going on in this case because this was anonymous speech. Since it's pretrial, I don't know what we can tell. I think there was a hearing that I could not find in the record. Yeah, there was is there hearing. evidence that this was anonymous? What, was, uh, what, was, what happened here was anonymous speech? If that is true, if it really was anonymous speech, then he will be acquitted. Because we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury that not only was this not anonymous speech, but that it did represent that it came from someone other than who it came from, and that the defendant intended for that misrepresentation alone to cause harm. Do you, but I you have, don't have to, I'm oh, sorry. I have another question. Yeah. Uh, I know you're not responsible for what's in the amicus brief, but in um, Appendix D of the, the Ethics Commissions. Yes, Your Honor. They refer to N. Ray Farah, I think is the name of the case. Yes, sir. And they say, look, this is an example that shows that this statute doesn't reach parity because um, Mr. Farah was, there were some allegations against him that he had violated this statute, I believe. And um, the Ethics Commission said in proposed findings, agreed findings, that it was clearly parity. Yes. And along the way, they found a couple of other um, offenses that were not raised initially, but they found. Are you familiar with what happened in that case? Because all, all Appendix D is is an unsigned copy of the proposed agreed findings. Did Mr. Fair assign them? I do not know what happened in the case that the amicus brief represents. Okay. Well, I couldn't find out either. But he waited four months after the ethics mission voted to accept the jurisdiction of the sworn complaint, Faro, and then four months later um, they came up with this ag proposed agreed settlement plan and I just didn't know what happened. Uh, I, I do not know. I could I could consult with the Ethics Commission and ask them to submit a, a, a supplement brief. If it's a matter brief. of record that might be helpful. Um, I was concerned with what I wanted to know is how long he had to wait, four months to, get, to begin with, on this what something was clearly a parody and how long he had to wait and whether it was ever settled to his satisfaction or whether, um, what happened? Yeah, I, I do not know the answer okay. to that, Your Honor. Thank you. I can say that what we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt is not only was it not anonymous, but that it was calculated to represent that it was a particular party that he was not a, associated with and that that representation alone was meant to do harm, not just I, the... I wanted to uh, sort of build on that case, though, with regard to parity. It seems to me that the Ethics Commission is actually reading in a requirement that this doesn't fall under the true source doctrine because anyone would know that it's parity. But I don't see that anywhere in the statute. I don't see that requirement that people could tell it's parity as being an a exception to charging someone under this election code. That would, and I cannot speak for the Elections Commission, mm -hmm. but my read of that is that so you're not genuinely representing that you are this party if you are parodying. Mm -hmm. And so, and so it does not even reach the first, first element, element of the statute, statute which, which is a knowing misrepresentation of the identity of the source, because, because it's, it's not a genuine, genuine misrepresentation. misrepresentation. Now, as to the actual constitutionality of the statute, the state has agreed since, since the initial hearing that this, was, this is a strict scrutiny matter. The Dallas Court of Appeals reached the wrong conclusion when they were applying strict scrutiny, in part because they had a faulty construction that read this as a disclosure requirement. There is no actual disclosure requirement here. This, the statute operates similar to the failure to ID statute in the Texas Penal Code. Paragraph B of Penal Code Section 3802 handles situations where you don't have a responsibility to tell a police officer who you are. Paragraph A, you've been arrested, you have to identify. Paragraph C, you have been pulled over in a car, you have to identify. But in paragraph B, you do not have to identify yourself to a police officer, but if you do identify yourself, you have to tell the truth. And this statute works much the same way. Nowhere in this statute 
is there a disclosure requirement that you actually have to identify the source of the communication? But if you do provide a source, you have to be telling the truth about who that source is. And if there are no other questions from the court, I see that I'm about out of time. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you, Your Honor. May I please support opposing counsel? My name is Kyle Tarion. Together with Allison Clayton, we represent John Stafford. We do so pro bono because legal fees are part of a deterrent effect of criminal conduct. And in this case, the conduct that's alleged to be criminal is free speech. Not just free speech, but political speech, celebrated speech. Um, I knew this would happen when I was preparing for this. I'd hear something, and now I need to get all out of order. Um, Th this case is an entirely intellectual exercise on the part of the Collin County District Attorney's Office, and they're doing it at the cost of an individual, a citizen of Collin County of the state of Texas. He spoke anonymously. The state is trying to construe the statute to not apply to anonymous speech. They say it applies to wrongful identification. Well, first off, there is another statute that already applies to wrongful identification, and secondly, Mr. Stafford did not identify himself. I know that's not on the record before this court, but it shocks me as somebody who knows that fact, litigating against another person who knows that fact. So this is an intellectual exercise. It should be mooted by now by their dismissal. That said, uh, the indictment. What's the other statute you just mentioned that covers? Uh, oh, oh, 255005, misrepresentation of identity. Really, there's a, a, a trio of statutes. There's the uh, Prohibition on Anonymous uh, Campaign Advertisements. Uh, that's 001. Uh, 005 is Misrepresentation of Identity. 004 is the True Source Statute. Um, Council, do you think that this statute, do you agree with the construction of, of the state that this statute doesn't really care about what the actual communication was? It only cares about the identification of who's doing the speaking. But it's difficult to answer. I, I don't agree with kind of their spin on words that are easy to understand. I'll state that much. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in this particular case and in other types of cases, a district attorney derives from the content the source. Mm -hmm. Because again, we're talking about emanations, which is like, when I think of emanate, I think of ooze, right? Something without, <laughs> without shape or form. Um, we're talking about representation, so not, not explicitity, but stating a representation of saying this thing stands for this. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess the way I, one way I conceptualize it to help me understand the state's thing and I, so is that why is this treated like identity theft? Like basically you're just sort of putting out, we're using someone else's identity to, to try and harm someone else. Like, except this time the identity isn't a specific identity because that's a real five. This is a campaign identity. So you actually have a campaign, and you're sort of stealing their name. Why is that? I mean, that's, that's one way of reading it. I'm just saying, why is it that we care then, if that's the way you're reading it, that what the actual communication was? I, I think that's an entirely different thing than the true source statute. So uh, in our briefing, I think we put it, like, what's the difference between misrepresentation of identity statute 05 and 04 true source? And, and I think the best way to think about it is uh, misrepresentation of identity is, is what Your Honor's talking about. That's 005. Right. True source is grants prosecutors the ability to prosecute speech that just seems a certain way. And, and that's exactly what has happened here. The district attorney in this indictment says this, the speech, after interpreting the well, content of the speech says it, it appears to be coming from a Republican campaign. You didn't say I'm a Republican. So they're putting processing for a vibe. Like, yeah. hey, yeah, hey here's, a, here's a vibe from this type of a Absolutely 100% that is, that's what is happening in this case. But importantly for a facial challenge is what can happen, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, we, we go back and forth between, well, we understand we're kind of making some as-applied complaints here, but this is a data point on, on the, the uh, facial channel spectrum, right? So, um, what we are asking uh, this court to do is, uh, namely, uh, uphold the fifth court's opinion, but uh, in that court, we, we raise facial invalidity. So, uh, facial invalidity when it comes to political speech, we think is um, 
I, don't know, I think there's some confusion between strict scrutiny and, and uh, exacting scrutiny, but we've we've articulated that we can satisfy either standard. I think strict scrutiny is going to be above exacting scrutiny. The standard for exacting scrutiny is that the the, the statute must be narrowly tailored to uh, serve a compelling or a I'm sorry an overriding government interest. Um, strict scrutiny, of course, is the, the compelling government interest. Uh, we believe that the statute is overly broad, so we've raised an overbreadth challenge. There's some argument there in, in the briefing about whether that's part and parcel with a, um, a narrow tailoring analysis. That actually raises a question. question. That raises a point that I wanted to ask you about too. Even if we go with the state, if we go with the state on its strict scrutiny analysis, don't we still have to remand for the overbreadth analysis? I, I think the states bite off more than they want to chew, and I shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't stand in their way. But um, strict scrutiny puts the burden on them to show that that uh, there's not even one application that could touch on free speech. Mm -hmm. That's the strict scrutiny analysis. Mm -hmm. it, if that's just, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's an appropriate articulation. Uh, it, it could be there's some older case law that says. Hey, look, if it's speech, it's strict scrutiny. If it regulates content, it's strict scrutiny. Uh, but I think kind of the more in vogue in, in recent cases, uh, this court's uh, opinion in Nuncio um, and uh, the, the Bonta opinion out of the United States Supreme Court say, this probably fits better with, with um, exacting scrutiny. And in that case, there is essentially an overbreadth analysis as part and parcel with um, the, the narrow tailoring analysis. Um, I, I think the best I can, I took a first minute class in law school and the first day they, the, the professor, Professor Tai uh, worked for Supreme Court justices says, it's messy and it's almost messy for, for by design. Um, and, and so the best I can kind of piece together is, I think over breadth, I have a burden to show the substantial number of applications and narrow tailoring is the, the, the state's burden. Regardless of whose burden, we have four pages of examples that that how this statute can be uh, applied to unquestionable free speech. Mm -hmm. um, so let, me, let me ask you. So uh, the state says this doesn't apply to anonymous speech. You agree with that? No. No. Okay. Um, would you be satisfied if our court construed the statute to not apply to anonymous speech? Not really. <laughs> I, you know, representing John Stafford, I would, because <laughs> uh, he spoke anonymously. So, I, in the interest of my client, that that'd be a win for him. Um, I always have trouble with court construing statutes to make it fit, and how far are we going to go to make it fit? Because it's already hard enough as a person wanting to engage in speech to know what the statutes say, but now we have to know what the court, how the court construed it. That becomes exceedingly difficult in an area where we don't want a whole lot of difficulty figuring out what you can and can't say. Um, the, the two other uh, independent grounds for relief here that we've raised are uh, that the statute is impermissibly vague and finally that it does put a essentially a chilling effect on anonymous speech. The fifth course opinion says it essentially um, uh, uh, prohibits it or uh, puts, puts a undue burden on anonymous speech. I think probably the appropriate terminology is chills it. Um, and chilling is due to language associated with an overbreadth challenge. The chilling effect is the kind of concern. I, I think that's probably true, but most importantly is, you know, we have this concept of, you know, our, our speech rights need room, room to breathe, right? Without Without being afraid of how somebody in a person of authority who could put me in jail might might interpret what I've done, right? And so, um, when it comes to anonymous speech, I, I think the scenario that we're in here is, if I speak without saying at the end, and I am John Stafford and I am a Democrat, which is his right to not say, uh, if I choose to speak in that manner, without, without that little proviso at the end, I am subject to prosecution potentially. It just depends on how my Republican district attorney views what I have to say after these candidates I spoke spoke about <laughs> go and run and tell them what I said. Um, Mr. Stafford correctly identified 
Republican candidates in a nonpartisan municipal election. That's all he did. He did, he did so with a little bit of pizzazz. He, he said, make Plano great again. Um, and, and, and because he put that, that little quote in there, uh, District Attorney Willis says that it has the appearance of coming from a Republican campaign. Um, that I don't think really fits with the statute, but it's that there lies the problem is the district attorney does, and he's using the statute, this 70 some year old statute, to, to, to prosecute him because he didn't sign his name and wasn't more explicit about who he was and, and who he stands with. Is that why it's not brought under 005? Because he didn't identify himself? I mean, yeah, I, again, I think, uh, again, the big difference here, if I could take a step back, I think this gives us some context. Uh, 004. The true source statute was passed in a climate where legislatures across the, the country were um, passing legislation to combat corporate and union participation in elections, basically shilling on behalf of, of candidates and, and not notifying the public, hey, I'm Corporation ABC or Labor Union XYZ. Um, and, and this was an attempt to, to get that out to the public, say, I'm, I'm actually the corporation here speaking. Um, I think over 70 years, <laughs> we now know that corporations have free speech too, and, and probably that intent is, an, is not a very legitimate one. Um, I think the best way to kind of couch the difference between 004 and 005 in this case is one requires ex explicit representation, the other one is just your control for what it seems like. Um, is 005 a better example of how that's nearly a narrow tailoring? It certainly is more narrow, uh, quite a bit more narrowly tailored. Um, you know, and I don't want to litigate 005 too much here, but sure, sure. Um, when we get into the government's interest, there's an interest even, I think, that I, I think there would be an illegitimate interest uh, even under 005, which is if you go back to this court's case in Dovey State, the court says, hey, what's wrong with just going after these people in, in tort litigation, right? That's a, that, that serves the interest that the government's articulating. But here's even worse. In the trial court, the state articulated fraud, sourcing, and suppression of, of votes and, and fake news as their legitimate government interest, uh, or I'm sorry, their, their overriding government interest. In Doe versus State, this court in construing 001, the anonymous uh, campaign advertisement said all those interests were insufficient to justify the wide net that, that the government's casting with its prohibition. Now before this court, it says that knowing, mister, knowing misattribution of the source is, is their, their interest and what they're trying to police, but that's already served by another statute, which again speaks directly to the analysis for whether the government's articulating a a, an overriding government interest. If it's already addressed elsewhere, it's not an overriding interest. Uh, and finally, again, and I touched on this already, the legislature's interest was corporations and labor, use, labor unions, which is, I think, since Citizens United, a illegitimate interest. Um, we also have electronic harassment uh, and regular harassment statutes. So uh, the government's interests are served elsewhere. When it comes to overbreadth, well, that's, 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 so you're, is that part of the overbreadth analysis saying the interests are served elsewhere? Is that is that part of that, or is that are those being used as an example of how you narrowly tailor the interest? I think or narrowly tailor the statute to serve the interest. I mean. This court in Newsio says there's essentially two doctrines. Mm -hmm. There's your. Uh, your, your scrutiny analysis, your facial challenge, and then your overbreath challenge. Um, prior to that, in, in Bonta, the United States Supreme Court seemed to suggest that the overbreath fits within narrow tailoring, which is part of the part of the, the, the facial challenge. Mm -hmm. Regardless of where, whether it fits in Newsio, what this court essentially says is we're concerned about substance, not form here. Uh, if you made an argument that it was overbroad and cited your examples, we're going to consider the overbreadth of the statute. Um, so whether we want to say, say it in the negative, it's not narrow, or in the positive, it's too broad, um, it's both. It's, it's not narrow because it's broad. Um, 
And, and so we cited four, four pages of examples. We have surrogate speech, right? Um, I think that is something that, that should um, probably uh, come near and dear to everybody's uh, personal campaigns if you run a Facebook page, right? Uh, I've run a political campaign in Collin County before. I was posting every day on behalf of my candidate. I had his permission to do that, uh, but I was posting as long as him. Okay? I was his, his voice. There is no exception in the statute, but my representation, that is my speech, my representation is representing that it emanates from a source other than its true source. I'm representing that it emanates from the candidate. I'm the one speaking. Uh, you have misunderstood rhetoric. Bob is a Republican. Well, that could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on who's hearing it, right? And if the person who, who hears it wants to prosecute you because they're ticked off that you said it, and they have a willing district attorney, well, now you find yourself in the shoes of John Stafford. Um, parody, uh, I think, fits uh, squarely within the, the statute. Um, uh, humorous social media accounts. Um, I was quite proud when the Fifth Court of Appeals uh, issued an opinion uh, citing Pierre Delecto. I did a Westlaw, and that's officially the only case that uh, cites to Pierre Delecto, which is Mitt Romney's alter ego. Mm -hmm. But he's representing that he's Pierre Delecto when he's really Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. And presumably he's doing it to avoid political consequences for his true opinions, and that's why he cast them as Pierre Delecto. Or, uh, well, it would also cover something like a, a fake Instagram account or fake social media account where you pretend to be someone so that you can get your opinions out without fear of reprisal. I, absolutely, and I, I think that uh, fits squarely within the examples. I, I think importantly in Ex parte Harry, this court says, when listing your, your uh, hypotheticals or your uh, articulating your overbreath, it can't be fanciful um, hypotheticals. Mm -hmm. And here, the only thing that would make these hypotheticals fanciful uh, is if we put faith in the district attorney to to interpret it in a way that that we all just hope that he would interpret it, and that is problematic in in the the First Amendment arena, where we're hoping that the district attorney doesn't <laughs> interpret this in a way that that jams us up later. Counsel, let me give you a, another example, real world example I thought of this morning. I'm handing I'm, I've got in my hand a bottle of hand sanitizer, and it says reelect. Judge Kevin Patrick Yeri for the Court of Criminal Appeals. If I handed that to you and then told you that this was created and emanated by Donald Trump PAC for Kevin Yeri, and I know that there is no such PAC, have I violated the statute? And if so, how would that make you believe that the statute's unconstitutional? I, I, I think. Yes, it could violate the statute. Um, I think the statute is unconstitutional, uh, not only because it touches your hypothetical, but it, because it touches so many hypotheticals that are unquestionably uh, free speech. So um, it's, it's, again, it's not just the as-applied data point, which we have in this case, which is unquestionably free speech, and which sounds like it's going to be dismissed when we get back to Collin County. Um, but it's. The, the, the full penalty of, of, of hypotheticals that, that this touches on. Your Honor, quickly, I'd like to talk, talk about the vagueness challenge. Um, I think this is probably the most boring way to uh, uh, uphold the fifth course opinion, but it's concrete and it's simple. Uh, in Buckley versus Vallejo, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court addressed the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, and in particular, a number of different provisions. But one provision, they looked at the individual expenditure limits and said, uh, and, and really drilled down on the fact that those expenditures bring themselves within the purview of the statute if it, uh, if it is made relative to a campaign. And the United States Supreme Court said, hold on, uh, penalizing speech that relates to a topic is problematic because that is vague. What relates to a topic? That's too vague. And what the Supreme Court did there is fixed it. They saved it by context. They said, well, we have three different statutory definitions here that we can put some guardrails on what Congress meant. Here, we don't have any, any guardrails whatsoever, no statutory definitions, save for one, campaign communication. It's a communication that relates to a campaign. I don't, I don't, I don't know how you could be any broader than that. That encompasses not just intentional campaign speak, but 
things that could be neutral, like go vote, right? That could be perceived as helping one party or the other and, and is totally campaign neutral. So for these four bases, we're going to ask that you uphold the, the fifth court's opinion, uh, which again is couched in terms of anonymous speech, but there are four independent bases to, to uphold the fifth court's opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, the court, a couple of points in rebuttal. Uh, first, Your Honor, Judge Keller uh, asked about whether this court could construe the statute in a way that, that excludes uh, anonymous speech. And, Your Honor, the answer to that is in Your Honor's own decision in Ex parte Thompson, where Your Honor stated that a statute can be construed in that way if the language is readily susceptible to such a construction. And here the language is readily susceptible to a construction that will render it constitutional by excluding anonymous, any kind of anonymous speech because the language does not reach anonymous speech. And in fact, in Granville, in State versus Granville, this court went so far as, I'm sorry, ex parte Granville in 1978, this court went so far as to say that if a statute can be construed in a way that makes it constitutional, the court has a duty to construe it in a way that makes it constitutional. Because the language is readily susceptible to such a construction, uh, that would be an appropriate construction, Your Honor. Your Honor's mentioned 255.005 and discussed that with opposing counsel. 255.005 reaches different conduct and speech altogether than the conduct and speech that is regulated by 255.004. So it is not a less restrictive means of achieving the same interests that we have in 255.004. There was also some discussion of in strict versus exacting scrutiny. The state already conceded. Uh, at Why is it well, not? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry counsel. counsel. Why is 255 not less restrictive? Because it's different. Uh, because it's different conduct, Your Honor. 255.05 is misrepresenting my own personal identity, regardless of whether I'm the source of that communication. Mm -hmm. It's misrepresenting my own personal identity within that communication. Mm -hmm. 255.004 is misrepresenting the source of the communication itself. And so they are different, they do reach different conduct. It's not that one is a less restrictive form of the other, it's that they are So source isn't synonymous with identity? No, Your Honor. Yeah, so the identity is the individual who is speaking, and if I'm in a campaign communication and I, I represent that I'm someone other than who I am, then that is 255. And in 255, the representation doesn't even have to be knowing. Whereas with 255 point, I'm sorry, with 005, it doesn't even have to be known, but with this statute, it does. How is it that a source of communication isn't an, identi an identity? Uh, because an individual has an identity, but a communication can come from a group or a campaign okay. altogether. Okay. Very good. Thanks. As for overbreadth, Appellant states that he presented four pages of examples of overbreadth, but all four of those pages were fanciful. They were all circumstances that the statute, when properly construed, will not reach any of the conduct listed in those four pages. Let me stop you there for a moment. Um, is it your position that the statute does reach parity or does not reach parity? Does not reach it parody? does not reach parity. How would someone know? Well, how would someone know that? Well, parity. First of all, it, the misrepresentation of identity is not a genuine misrepresentation of someone's identity. And second, it's the, the representation of the identity itself would not be what would cause the harm. It would be the content of the parody. It would be the content of the campaign communication, not the misrepresentation. For instance, if an, if an actor is on Saturday Night Live being in one of their famous political skits, no one is suggesting that the actor playing candidate X is actually candidate X. It's just an actor playing a part. So it's not even a genuine misrepresentation. Well, that's true, but there are uh, less obvious examples like the one in Henry Farah, where the Ethics Commission accepted the, the allegation that he violated the, the statute, and then four months later said it's obviously parody. Well, they reached the right conclusion, and that, and that is now precedent for the Ethics Commission. But how, I mean, well, I, I mean, you're saying that it's not genuine, but I mean, so much parody, so much really good parody ends up looking very genuine. You can easily be mistaken as, and, you can, and because of that, you can make the argument that it is intended to be taken seriously. Like, the whole birds aren't real thing gets its power from the idea that 
this guy has meticulously crafted the idea that this is a real thing. And it's not. And that's part of the joke. And so he wants it to be taken as a real thing. In that case, it would be the content of the communication itself and not the misidentification that would create the harm. Mm -hmm. And so it would not, the statute would not reach it. So if there are no further questions from the court, I, I do see that I'm out of time, and I thank the court for its time. Thank you, Chris. The case is submitted. All right.